As we have hopefully already said this morning, good morning. Thank you for joining us on a, in Calgary, actually beautiful Friday morning. I'm not sure that the sky is quite that clear. Um, as you can see on your screens, that is our view uh, from our main building, Heritage Hall. So for those of you who have never been to State's main campus, we're based in Calgary and Heritage Hall being one of our signature buildings, although the newer ones probably carry far more weight these days. Wherever you are today, thank you for pausing just for a moment. And for those of you here in Calgary, as Craig and I are and Sait, we just like to take a moment to acknowledge that we are situated on the traditional territories of the Blackfoot Confederacy. Today that encompasses our indigenous people of the Treaty 7 region, which is the Siksika, the Bakani, the Ghani, the Sutina, the Stony Nakoda, and the Northwest Métis homeland. Sait also acknowledges all the people who make their homes in the Treaty 7 region of Southern Alberta. So thank you. It's always important for us just to take a moment to recognize that this is a traditional land and it is a place where we're all walking in the footprints of our Métis people. Thanks, Greg. Thank you, Jenny. Um, as always, so well done. You know, the view's a little different right now as the, uh, the soccer pitch is being resurfaced, so. It's true. <laughs> it, it, it looks very gray and uh, frankly, a little bit ugly right now with the piles of rubber kicking around. But anyway, we're not here to talk about that. <laughs> we're here to talk about employee well-being. And um, as we get going, I'll, I'll be very curious, folks, I'm going to ask you just to drop some thoughts in the chat as to why this topic resonated with you. Uh, it's one of our larger registration numbers mm. in, in the last couple of months. And uh, so you know, employee well-being, what are you hoping to hear today? What are you hoping to learn? Jenny, I'm going to kind of start this from um, the aspect of I used to have a manager years ago. Um, we get to summertime and his, his phrase always used to be, folks, there's no off-ramp to vacation and there's no on-ramp back from vacation. In other words, you're, you're busting it right up until... 5 p.m. Friday before you leave and you're jumping right back in to running traffic the morning you get back. And um, I always used to think that was that wasn't too bad a piece of advice, but I'm not so sure about that anymore. Maybe I've gotten older, wiser. Uh, but this whole this whole concept uh, for me around well-being, especially as we come into the summertime here, is you know, do you are you making sure you are resting as hard as you work as hard as you do? But a couple spots there for you to jump off from. I'm not sure where, where you want to take that or what that triggers for you. And I'll keep a, a look at the chat here for what folks are throwing in. But yeah, it, it's a curious one too, though, because like <laughs> there's no off ramp and there's no on ramp. I, I wonder if it's in the language that, that that sort of puts the hairs up on the back of our necks. And yet when you look at it, your job is your job. So we do have a requirement. Um, and one of the things that I remember doing in the past is, and that was when I used to work for an organization, because I work everywhere now, but is to get back from holiday and actually not start, I almost have an extra day at home so I could get caught up where I wanted to be. And or in your calendar, book out that first day back so that you can, you, you create your own soft start as it were. And so my husband and I, we would take on that day, which was still, it was booked as holiday, but we would take half a day each and comb through in those days, it was hundreds of emails, goodness knows what it would be today. And so I think a lot of this, when we're talking about it is, what are you doing for you? Like that your leader then, I'm not sure I like his tone or his words, but, but he has a point, like you have a job to do and he wants you there and he needs you there because in his hand, it's the performance and the accountability. But we also have a responsibility in this conversation too. Yeah. Um, and before we move on, Jenny, I'll just get you to stop sharing the, sharing the screen there. Oh, thank you. See, it's on a different screen. I'm all backwards in here. There we go. It's okay. Um, it was a nice view. Um, <laughs> But you know, you you touch on a few really interesting things there, and I think so. There's a few things in there for me. Is one is as a leader and as an individual, you know, how are you taking care of yourself? It's the old yeah. whose oxygen mask are you putting on first? Two is how are you taking care of your team? 
And that's an interesting, that may be an interesting conversation for some leaders or managers in and of itself is that, is it your job as the leader to quote unquote, take care of your team or individuals capable of taking care of themselves? And then the third one there, um, I completely forgot. So I'll come back to that. I'm glad because there's only two just, ones. Just being transparent here, I'm like, <laughs> I had three and then one of them disappeared. So, and it's funny because I understand. Um, so <laughs> the first one, like the first one, seriously, this is a this is a classic. Put your own oxygen mask on first before you help others. And so, you know, it, it becomes a really tricky part there. So first off, if you're going to put your own oxygen mask on first, where does your oxygen come from? And that's really different for different people. So there are some who are energized by the social part. And so my oxygen comes from hanging out with good people. I feel energized, I feel refreshed, I can come back to it. For others, your oxygen is that solo time and it's being outside and it's going for a walk or it's just completely decharging, discharging and doing something completely different from the work world. So I'm fully on, yes, you've got to take care of that oxygen. You've got to know where your oxygen comes from. And when we're looking at a team setting, that is very different for everybody on that team. So that can be a really important area there for yourself is know know where that comes from. And then the second thing you were leading into there, is it a leader's responsibility? As a leader, the people who report to you are in your care. Like, you know, your job is this performance and this accountability, but people are still in your care. And so, yes, I think it now firmly sits within your responsibilities and accountabilities, but I think it's a, it's a two-way part. Like, you, you cannot be responsible for my mental health. You can't. I have to be responsible for my mental health. But you can help by ensuring, you know, or... or sort of being aware of and taking accountability for the environment that's created when I work for you, for what is that culture that I come to when I come to work. And and here's the big one that leaders I think struggle with is what are you role modeling? Because Mm. if you don't take your holiday or you take your computer on your holiday and you're emailing me all the way through holiday or texting or teams, whatever that might be, or you know, you're still sending emails late at night and we haven't had the conversation around where those boundaries sit, it's really hard for me to, to do something completely different. Yeah. So, okay, I'm writing all sorts of things down here. Uh, but I do wanna to pop to the chat because there were some really good comments in here as to what folks were hoping to hear about. Uh, Charles, uh, I, think, and we, I think we will certainly get into this a little bit. Uh, hoping to hear something about psychological health and safety. I think this goes, like, there's something there, Jenny, around boundaries, et cetera, being able to be on a team where you can express those and set those. Um, just kind of go through here. Well-being equals engagement equals progress. That, that's, I like that, Mandy. Uh, employee well-being is front and center now. Yeah, it, I, I think it's become far more prevalent, especially over the last three years as we've gone through the pandemic. Like, think about how that has shifted and there might actually be something in here about you know are we like okay we're done we're through it we've we've helped everybody we can get back to work now and i think you've got a, I think you've got a thought there um <laughs> whether i'll share it or not <laughs> that's, that's fair yeah um yeah so just a couple things i don't know but there's so much meat in this. And I think maybe uh, your comment there around role modeling, I want to touch on a little bit, because this is one for me, I do think that is interesting is that as a leader, yes, you should be role modeling what you want to see. Um, But to your point around every individual gets their oxygen from a different place, you may as a leader, have a different work style, et cetera, than what your team does. Maybe, maybe you are um, you know, a late night person. Maybe you are the way you've set up your day. You know, I'm going to go to the gym in the middle of the day, and then after dinner, I'm going to catch up on some email, right? So I, I think there has to be some give and take in that one because, you know, everybody's phone has the ability to shut off notifications, 
right? So just because I send an email after hours doesn't mean one, you have to actually see it, acknowledge it or respond. But anyway, just thoughts on that. I think because I think there's something in this role modeling piece that we need to be careful on not putting everything on the leader be to be perfect. Uh, yeah, for sure. And, and and we know well, we know, but we don't always run by it that perfect doesn't exist. And the minute that you start to be perfect in any one of those P's, we usually go perfect, proving um, and people pleasing. And, and all of those contribute to the stress, to the burnout, to the lack of well-being. So you're absolutely right. We, we're not looking for perfect here. But what we are looking for are those organic, those organic conversations, and there's a cadence to the conversation. So to your point earlier too, you know, the summer often looks different than the winter. And, and we constantly keep talking about performance and accountability, but I cannot perform if I'm not healthy, if my well being, like well being is being well. So if I don't have those in place, my performance will suffer. So the two marry quite beautifully within there, but it's a conversation that we don't often have. And so, you know, it's, it's a team meeting, it's 10 minutes in a team meeting, but it's also knowing your people and knowing your people really well. So we've talked about this on this show, it's field hockey season, we have a child that plays field hockey at, at a competitive level. And so I'm at the turf a lot of the time. That's so you'll find me on my email in the evening. To your point, we take a couple of hours out, we go do that, and then I'll come back and do that. Now I have choices. I can either schedule a send, anybody says to me, you know, I don't want to receive your emails at night. I can schedule the send. Thank you, Outlook. But we can also have that conversation beforehand where we know our team finishes work at five or six o'clock as a, a level. And after that, there is no need to respond. And in fact, anyone who's ever had an email from me, it says on the bottom of my email, my work hours may look different than yours. Please only respond during your own work hours. So the role modeling part is is that I am looking after myself. <clears throat> and the leader part is I am helping you to look after yourself. And so, you know, if you, if I never send emails in the evening, <laughs> there's a lot of people saying, if only you didn't, um, but if I never send emails in the evening, and then all of a sudden you're seeing late night emails from me as a leader, the question is, Jenny, everything all right? Your work patterns mm -hmm. seem to have changed. That's a really good point. Really good point. And I think what you're getting to here now is, is the other thing that you you said that kind of triggered me a little, not triggered in the bag, but just made me think the whole concept around how does a leader, you know, I, I'm not responsible for your mental health. I can't do anything for your mental health directly. It's like motivation. I can't motivate you, Jenny. The only person that can motivate you is you. Yeah. But as a leader, you have the ability, the responsibility, um, either intentionally or unintentionally, the environment that you create, and then, you know, mm -hmm. contribute to those conditions that help support mental health, help um, make it okay to talk about it in the workplace, et cetera, et cetera. So um, it kind of touches on a little bit that, that's been going on in the chat here around, you know, having leaders in the past who didn't support mental health, et cetera. So you know, do you want to kind of lean into that a little bit? Like as a leader, how do you, you know, what can you do to make sure that you're creating that space, right? You just talked about a little bit, you know, get to know your team. That seems pretty straightforward, but what else? I think, I think a lot of this comes down to, so first off, we have to look at what stress and, and, and burnout look like like what so stress stress by definition is a negative a negative reaction to pressure and so straight away pressure hits each of us differently and so you know in it's not so much the case anymore but it used to be the people who got promoted were the people who are super good at their job and usually they were urgency addicts and they you know they could just they could operate in that high pressure environment yeah. and not everybody does and so you know we're right back to that point pay attention pay attention pay attention 
And what does that pressure look like coming from you? So are we being realistic? We are all trying to work with less people, get more done with less people in a society that the whole world is on fire at the moment. And I apologize for anybody who's close to, to the awful fires, but we are, we're just, we're, we're burning. And so are we actually paying attention to what that looks like for people? And are we being reasonable? Yes, there's an outcome that we need to achieve, but is that a, a realistic expectation? And I think that's one of the biggest things that we can take a look at. And the other things, they sound so simple, but they're so real. Like, what are the conversations that you're having? So if the conversations around your team table, team table, if you're listening as a leader, are all about these, you know, the threats that are on us, the resistance against us, we're better than them, we need to be special. Like, that's all very, that causes stress that conversation. Whereas if we're looking at, okay, what are we doing that we want to replicate? How are we really doing? We can actually change those conversations from a leadership perspective and that changes the environment and that changes our mindsets because really that mental health is a lot of it, not all of it. A lot of it is to do with that mindset that we carry into the workplace, into the conversations, into each space so how we look at it like I can create stress for for myself by saying oh geez I have to do this I have to do that and I have to go there today I'm exhausted before I've even started the day mm -hmm. and yet if I say okay Craig I, I want us to wrap up the the end of our conversations process by 9 15 if possible because I I'm really looking forward to going and hanging out with the group that I have today here at SAIT and after that I want to go via train because I'm going to get to the university and I want to see Soph play hockey. Now that's a day that I'm looking forward to. And so simply in that mindset shift, I'm no longer, to use buzzwords, I'm no longer the victim, but life is happening by me. And the other part, and you said this right at the beginning, though, is when we start to do that, and again, this is for me, is okay, where, where am I being as ridiculously unproductive as I am being productive. So if, if we don't create the break in this space, yeah. we, can't, we can't do that. And that's why this is so employee and leader, but it's a conversation, it's happening more post pandemic, but it's a conversation I don't think that happens enough. Yeah, really, yeah. It's a very, hmm, so much there. Um, there's a few things coming through here in the chat. So you've got me in one of those uh, split brain <laughs> moments where I've been reading, listening, trying to figure out where we go next year. But um, there is a couple of comments here that I think, and I, I was going to joke when you talked about pressure earlier, Jenny, that, you know, that boss of mine that I used to have would also say, but Craig, pressure creates diamonds, right? And it, it's interesting, Beatrix came in with a comment here, uh, pressure can kick the brain in to perform better for a short time. But yeah. Yes. Right. So, so, so very important. Yes. As, as a leader, you're going to have to recognize it can't be all rainbows and butterflies and everything all the time. You're going to ebb and flow. You're going to have moments where it's like, Hey team, we got to kick in here right now. But if we get through this, we just went through this with the, the short-term project here, a uh, small team, we got through it. And on the other end, we're going to take a little bit of time to rest and relax. Right. Yeah. And, and the thing that, yeah. Okay, so here's where I often come back to when we're time management, actually, is where we seem to talk about this a lot. But if if you think of um, a marathon runner, okay, and, and to run a marathon takes a ridiculous amount of energy. Like There is a reason I'm not going close to a marathon ever in my life. I'm full credit to anyone on here who has. But marathon runners who do it like properly, they don't train seven days a week. They train four, maybe five, depending on their level of madness. And they don't run a full marathon every single day. And yet we, if you think about most people's normal lives, okay, they're up early o'clock. There's a great handful that have checked that phone before their feet have even hit the carpet or the hardwood floor. And then they're racing all day long, like just racing, racing, racing. And they get to the end of the day and then there's, 
the home stuff, the kids stuff, people have to eat, there's cleaning, there's chores, there's your own passion, hobby that you get involved in. And goodness knows how many episodes of Netflix and we'll check the phone just one more time before we go to bed and then we get into bed and we rinse and repeat. And we're doing yeah. that day in, day out, day in, day out. And so we're basically, we're just constantly running this marathon with no sense. And so when you get that discharge time, to your point, the ebb and the flow, that's when we get a healthier perspective. And, and you know, the, the fun thing to do is like, anyone who's on this call today go for a walk go for a walk today and see how your mind changes when you come back afterwards although it's going to be 29 degrees so be safe if you're here <laughs> <laughs> but we are we're just more refreshed we see it differently and the number of ideas come from different places but until we engage in that we don't go there we just think to sit here and keep blindly grinding on will get us there so i saw somewhere in the chat it scanned through work smarter not yeah. harder and and it is it's about what are we doing in the time that we're working yeah exactly um good so question here that sherry has posed and i want to kind of preface it with i think so much well-being at work can somewhat be tied into times of change times of ambiguity uh, mm -hmm. to your point earlier uh, those periods can create more stress, more pressure, right? Mm -hmm. So Sherry's question here is, what is the best way to help individuals through a leadership transition and ensure that psychological safety is being considered? Thank you, Sherry, for the little side note about missing the Q&A. So, okay. <laughs> so and by leadership transition, I'm assuming we're changing leaders. That's what that, that part means. Yeah. I, yeah okay uh, that's, uh, that's all go that's all I'll take it a leadership transition yeah so I mean it's going to take time to build the the culture the environment again and it always takes time it takes maintenance to maintain psychological safety if you're the employee group and the leader is changing get to know your leader actually have conversation with them get to know how they work. Um, remember that first, when we talk about psychological safety, we talk in levels and we talk about inclusion safety as that first level of psychological safety. So how do you help them belong to the team that's created? They're gonna want to make their changes. I mean, things will change, but what are the things that are working? What would you like to replicate? There is an opportunity for that conversation. And, and what are your norms? What are your norms that are not written down? And I think that the awareness in that is, this is what we have as they come in as a leader, it's gonna depend on their leader style mm -hmm. as to what they want to keep and change and work with. And then if you're the leader going through that transition, so you're joining a group as a new leader, to me, the, the sort of first point of respect is, what have you got that's working here? What do you love? What would, what would you like to stay? And, and then it's a, a choice and an equation. Does that work for me? Can I work within that, that setup? And as long as you have a clear vision, understanding of what the outcome is that we're trying to get to, then can we make that work to get to that outcome? I like it. It goes back to so much around what we've talked about here before is just have the conversation. Yeah, but, always. You know, right. I think the, the challenge in there sometimes, and of course, not knowing the specifics of any, if Sherry's referring to a specific type of leadership transition here, but, you know, if you're, if the leaders transition because the past leader um, didn't voluntarily choose to change, um, you know, is this a performance issue? Is there other things going on? And then, of course, you've got a whole different dynamic there. Um, yeah, yeah. But I think it's, and I think the other thing with these pieces too that I think is often overlooked is just the concept of timing. Yes. I think as individuals or as humans, we want something's going to change, at least for me, you know, you want it done and you want the change over and let's move on, right? The longer out the change takes or the longer it takes to get there, more ambiguity, stress, et cetera, that build up. But 
if you've got a new leader, this you're not going to have this conversation on day two and everybody knows what the new norms are. Like this is, it's, yeah. it takes time and you've got to be okay with that. It does. And you, you bring up a really good point, but we're back to, we're all different. We're all a little bit messy and you like things to, you, here's the, okay, we're going to get this done. Okay. And, and others, yeah, it's just a little bit more of a walk in the park and that can be, that causes pressure in itself. And the number of leaders we hear from, they're like, why won't they just get it? And so then there's a whole nother conversation that has to happen because you know, extend the kindness, extend the care. Yes. And when we're talking about bigger changes, this is crucial because it does take some people longer and some people will resist. So those are, you know, if we're not tackling those conversations, we don't know the answer to that. And there comes a point where as a leader, you kind of have to get in behind with that support. Okay, well, we have to move on. Here's the accountability. Here's a part. And, And that is a, that is a careful conversation, I think. But if it doesn't happen, we either leave people behind, we we push them out when actually one good conversation could have nudged them forward. And I, I was chatting with a lady yesterday in, in one of our SAID groups and she said, I just approached it differently. And I, and I asked my employee, she said, I'm frustrated that I can't help you. What is the obstacle that I can't see? And she said she was floored by the answer because it was nothing like what she had created in her mind was causing the resistance. And and now they're able to move on. But if she hadn't taken that different approach and put the employee well-being experience ahead of her leader needs, she wouldn't have that answer and they wouldn't be further ahead now. And that took five minutes out of her day. What a great question. Yeah, it was was brilliant. A um, couple comments and question I want to get to here. So Carla earlier in the chat was just saying, you know, if COVID's taught us anything is that work needs to be if, if flexible. Yes. Um, and employees have embraced it. I think the other aspect of that, that Carla's touching on here is that, you know, as a result, you see people working all sorts of different hours, weekends, evenings, et cetera. Um, but the key point that she's made here is as a leader, you still need to make sure you're checking in to see if they're doing okay. Right. Yes. The, yes. the assumption that just because folks are now working whenever and they're enjoying the flexibility doesn't necessarily mean that they have great well being, I guess, is what we're getting at here. And I, I just thought that was a really interesting point. It, it's an excellent point. And there's a couple of things that sit in there too. So finally, we're moving away from the fact, well, if your bottom's in a seat, you're worthy. And we look far more at, at it, you know, what is, what is your value and contribution? Like, what have you contributed this week? What progress have you made? So that is one area that we have to have on. And then much more to, to her point, sorry, I've forgotten the name already, um, but much more to her point, how are you doing? And if you're not seeing your people, then that cadence of conversation almost has to be a little bit more intense actually because you know if you if you and I cross paths every day then there's a lot more we pick up so much more we get it but when you're not having contact with people for two three four days in a row you don't know and yeah. and this is and often the confusion here is you you don't need to know what goes on for me outside the work hours unless I choose to talk to you about it but you do need to know how I'm doing and that, that is a question. And we talked about this so much during the pandemic, didn't we? Because it starts with, <laughs> I did it to you today. You said to me, how are you? I said, oh, I'm good, thanks. Yeah. Like, Great, that's a really helpful answer. <laughs> so, you know, so, so how's, it, how's it really going has been our, our go-to. Uh-huh. And, and again, pay attention. But it's also that, um, you know, that acronym of FINE. And, and that fine is often fearful, insecure, nervous, or emotional. And if, you, if you're paying attention when you ask the question, you're able to say, Jenny, really? Hey, you know, it's okay, I've got it under control. I've got 10 minutes, Do you, should we go grab coffee? And have that conversation sooner rather than later. If you think that somebody is beginning to, to struggle to teeter, and we can only pick that up by paying attention to the cues because there are few people who will say, 
uh, this is the beginning of a downward spiral. Like we just, that's too much to, to throw out yeah. there to start with. Yeah. Um, yeah, very good. Couple of really good questions here. I wanna to get to uh, Donovan, love this question. So today's discussion appears to be focused on white collar workers. Yeah. Who specifically have the opportunity, flexibility, et cetera, you've described breaks, flex time, their work location. Um, how would your advice differ for leaders of groups where the workers have committed hours of work because they directly serve clients during regular or extended business hours? How can we give flexibility to more rigid roles? Great question. Great question. Um, and, and the context is going to differ. So just picking up on what I heard there, if, if the hours are long and the work is intense, when they finish, they finish. And, and I think there's a piece, and I haven't worked in this environment enough to, so <laughs> I apologize if this is rubbish, but you know, I often hear people talking about, well, just take the overtime, take the overtime, take the overtime. <laughs> and overtime is, is good and helpful for people. And how much overtime are you allowing? So we, there's that, that care piece. You, you can't do 10 days of overtime in a row. Like, well, and I don't know what those levels are. So that's one piece is when the work yeah. finishes, the work finishes. But the other thing too is the flexibility on the job. And we don't often think about this. We, we talk about it within autonomy. So if you want to give somebody autonomy, there's four sort of areas for which that autonomy can come from. Time, technique, task, and team. They're all T's. And so the, the time piece, it sounds like in this case is very much set. So when we go to the others, what are the tasks that they have? Is there any choice and any flexibility in the tasks that are being assigned and how they're being assigned? And, and if that's at its full flexibility, are you able to move it around so there's diversity within that? So there's differences in the tasks that people do if they want that, that change. And can we, you know, if, if Jenny really enjoys doing something and it's the same thing that Craig hates doing, okay, well, it makes perfect sense. Let's put people where their strengths are and where they're good and where they can make progress. And then the technique now, sometimes, especially out in the field, there's only one technique, right? We, we don't have a choice on that because it's a matter of life and death. But sometimes there is a choice in technique. And so, you know, as a leader, let it go. Your way might be the best way for you, but it's probably not the best way for everybody else. And, and that's within the realms of safety, of course. And then the other one that's interesting is team. And, and this one is really, really important is, you know, when you're hanging out with people for a prolonged time, do you like them? Do you feel good with them? Because mm. if you're hanging out with toxic people for a long time, that has an effect on us. And you know, if, there, if there's no choice in team, then, oh my goodness, at lunchtime, can you go find someone else or get that break for yourself as well? So I don't know if that answers that, but it's the best I can come up with here. <laughs> no. Yeah, no, it's it's an interesting conversation and it's I appreciate Donovan bringing it up because I yeah, do but... think we, we tend to focus more on um, the intellectual workers versus the blue collar workers in some of these conversations. And I like it. The, the, the chat carried on a little bit. And I think what I'm taking out of it too is, you know, to the your earlier point, the impact of leaders modeling good behaviors for, I'm going to assume their crews, their teams, et cetera. Uh, and, and it's just a sentence in here. It's amazing how little comments can have a big impact. And so I can just imagine, you know, Comments on a job site perhaps might carry a little bit different color, flavor, tone than perhaps comments in the, you know, the hallways of downtown, right? And so it, 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 it's just interesting. I, I appreciate the broader perspective here. There's two, two big, big things within there. And one, um, I've talked about him a lot. John Amici is one of my preferred authors at the moment <clears throat> and his book actually is called the 12 promises of giants but he talks about how leaders are giants and so a comment from you that you mutter is the same as yelling it through the halls you tiptoe through so no you're stomping through the place like we carry as leaders a much greater impact than we would ever imagine and we have to be cognizant of that 
and, and that totally feeds into that entire psychological safety conversation. And actually, as a as a knock on, and we should I should just take a second here. Psychological safety is about creating an environment for your workers. Psychological health and safety is the mental well-being side of it, and the two are absolutely married within there. Like they integrate so closely. And so that's the first part is yes, pay attention to the comments that you're making, the flippancy. But the other piece as a leader too is what are you tolerating? And so banter at its best is fun and it lifts everybody who's within there. Um, I grew up in England, like sarcasm is, is one of them. And, it, and it's funny until the point that it's not. And so, you know, as a leader, You've got to know your people, but you've got to be paying attention because there will be louder voices that are dominant in there. And as a leader, what are you tolerating? And so the guardrails yeah. always the permission and respect. Um, that's it. This is a really good point. Yeah, no, excellent. Um, another question here. We talked about what to do during a leadership change, and this might be a similar question. But as an employee, how do you maintain your well-being when um, they're restructuring your entire department? I think yeah. it kind of comes to the whole concept of how do you how do you keep your sanity? I guess when all the lack of a better term, when every when, there, when there's perhaps lots of change and chaos going on around you. Okay, this is this is a really cool one. Um, you you have to look after you, so self care. I, I saw briefly someone had talked about the bucket. Um, the stress bucket is a big thing going around social media at the moment. And your stress bucket is really different to everybody, the filling bucket thing that we talk about. This is, this is a different analogy. But your bucket gets filled up by everything that goes on in the day. And you can sort of drain water out of your bucket by the good things that you do for yourself. But if you're not looking after yourself, that bucket fills and fills and then this tiniest event happens and you can kick the bucket over. And then it's just an absolute mess is the, is the simplest way to explain that. So when this is going on, you have to prioritize you to a degree. So first off, and, and this is key, if you know it's going to happen, like let's say you know it's gonna happen in a month or two's time, now is the time to be working on it. Set yourself up for success. And so a couple of the sort of key and easy things um, to remember is when you're thriving, what are you doing? Are you taking mm. your breaks? Are you eating well? Are you sleeping well? You know, where's your energy coming from? And we have lots of different forms of energy. So physical energy, mental energy, spiritual energy. Um, oh, there's always one more and I can't remember it. Emotional energy, that would be the other one within there so you know what what looks good when you're thriving okay how much of that can we put into place and then the other one that I like I often get people to do this in a classroom if you stand on your tiptoes on one leg it is really difficult to balance to move forward so there you go okay stay there for a while how are you doing <laughs> All right, you guys, this is not a great place for Craig to hang out because I'm going to ask you to make an important decision whilst you're on your tiptoes on one leg so what would it take for you to put both feet firmly on the ground? Like, just stop. Just stop and put two feet on the ground and then breathe. And then within that thing, I always come back to what's in your control. And so when we work within our control, we can take action. Action makes us feel good. And so, you know, set your boundaries, set your to-do list, whatever that might be, so that you have a way that you're going to move forward. And sometimes, and I'm going to flip to leaders here for a second, when it's all turbulent and when it's all crazy, it's a really healthy thing to say, okay, this, this is madness. Like, let's just appreciate what's going on around us. Mm -hmm. So for today, here's what we're going to do. Here's what we're going to achieve. And for this week, this is what we'll do. Or maybe you can go to two or three weeks, but that just helps people to keep moving rather than get stuck in that kind of downward spiral. And, and control allows us to kind of to be in charge. And when we, and we feel the control, the calm comes a little bit. Yeah. I love it. Um, yeah. And I'm not very good on my tiptoes. Um, <laughs> digital well-being. Another question here around yeah. digital well-being. Do you have any best practices to share 
about creating policies or behaviors for how to deal with the plethora of technologies we use every day. We mentioned a few points around email, et cetera, but uh, any other thoughts around it? It's, you know, I'm not sure, so sure pre-COVID we would have been necessarily using the term digital well-being, but <laughs> certainly, yeah. right? Um, so it, when we think about technology, like basis, basis to come from, we're supposed to be in charge. So, where's my phone? So, can you see that? Yeah. I'm mm -hmm. in, when I'm in charge of this, that is a good relationship. When this starts to be in charge of me, that's a disaster. And so, again, it comes back to those sort of boundary places. Where, where do I hold that control? Do I have control over? So, I just got a new phone and it's got this funky thing on it where it decides that my day is over. And I figured out now how to change it. But at one point I decided my day was over at 10 o'clock at night. And, and the whole phone just went to grayscale. Well, it's virtually impossible to do social media in grayscale. It's kind of cool. And I'm like, oh, that's, that's kind of effective. And now when I played with it a bit, I can shut people out and I can only make sure that family come in. And so, yes, that takes a bit of time, but I'm creating again, those boundaries on the technology. I, I think with that, that digital well-being, you know what I think the one of the key things is, and this is tough, we have to realize that we're not as important as we think we are sometimes when it comes to the work world. And, and so when we detach just a little bit from that, we realize that the email can wait until tomorrow. And so then we can, you know, move away from it. And, and the other day I forgot my phone actually. And, and the only thing that bothered me was the fact that, well, my kids can't get hold of me if they need me. And it took 30 seconds to realize they have at least four other, including my husband and, and, and our others, where they could go to if something was wrong, they would be yeah. fine. And, and once I got beyond that hurdle that they would be fine, the morning was fantastic. Like the focus I put into the people that I was meeting that morning, I hope it was lucky then, but it was certainly was a good conversation for me because I wasn't distracted by that, that constant buzz that, that goes on. And so, you know, it's the small things again. How do you set the break for yourself in the day? Yeah, and most email can wait more than a day. Um, I frequently will return from two or three weeks vacation and delete everything in my inbox. Just delete it you would be surprised how few people return and say, hey, you haven't gotten back to me yet. I just got back from vacation. Can you resend it so it's at the top of my inbox? Yeah. Oh, yeah, no problem. All right? Email is one of the biggest time sucks in the history of time. That's just, I'll get off my soapbox now. Well, but there's all that stuff too. Like, no, nobody's going to remember you for the number of emails that you sent or answered I mean yes there's a job to do but but they won't and and the only people who will say who will remember that you worked late is your family um and yeah. so we just have to put some better awareness around this 100 percent. but Jenny we are at 8 45 speaking Ooh, of time know. let's go there we have a moment for your soapbox thought so yes. now I, I, I will just add, if anybody gets mad at you for not returning your email, please do not say that I said to do so. <laughs> for once, it's Craig said so. Not. <laughs> I might remember that, actually, if you're waiting for one from me, but that's a different conversation. For that's me. different. Yeah. yeah. So just in case, and, and I think we might have, if we have any brand newcomers, hopefully today has uh uh, made you feel good about joining us. We always like to finish with one big idea. We could have had the soapbox idea, but we have a different one. Uh, two things that you can take away straight away and, and contemplate or put into action or build on. And then obviously three questions as well. So I did touch on this earlier. The, the big idea is that, you know, for all those leaders out there, if we're looking for high performance, if we're looking for those outcomes, we're not going to get there unless we have health and self-care plus that input. And the input is the work that we do. And so, you know, those of you who are sort of struggling with, well, is, does well-being belong in the workplace? Yes, it does. Because if I am well, 
then I will perform better than if I am not. That's my big idea for the day. Here's two things you can take away. I like this one. Do you have a to don't list? So um, I'm all about the lists. I've books full of lists and they do help me make progress through the day. But those two don't lists can be really, really crucial as well. We just talked about digital well-being. You know, it might be don't check social media until lunchtime. And that will allow you to make progress and then you'll you'll feel good within that. The to don't list, don't work past six o'clock this evening or four o'clock, whatever that is Friday. Like, does that matter? What time is that piece? Uh, don't accept meetings where I'm not a valuable contribution to the conversation. All of this just allows you to lower the stress a little bit. And, and that's a place where you can take charge in there too. Remember every yes that you offer somebody is a no to yourself. Are you okay with that no? that no is an expense of your health and your well-being, then you want to think twice about that piece within there. So the to don't list is our first takeaway. The second one is a curious one, and we didn't go there, but optimism is kind of getting a bad deal at the moment because of all the toxic positivity that has sort of influctuated and, and, and taken over. And so by optimism, what I'm really talking about is the solutions focused and recognizing the good. And as I said earlier, our whole world is just a little bit crazy at the moment. And if you're not looking for the good, you might not be finding it at all. So twice today, pause, what's good? It might be the people around you. It might be the day. It might be something that you're looking forward to, but every single thought that we have has a chemistry of some kind. So if you're on crappy thoughts all day, there's a ton of ugly chemistry hanging out. Your body doesn't feel good. When you have a happy thought or a good thought or a positive thought, you get the good chemicals, the dopamine, the oxytocin and all those, and you feel better. You feel good. And when you feel better or you feel good, you're going to show up differently as well. And that'll make all the difference for the people around you. And Craig, just three questions. I was on my best behavior for this morning. Those who haven't been before, this three often turns into seven or five, but just three <laughs> questions that you can com uh, con contemplate for your Friday. There you go, one big idea, two things to do, and three questions to con contemplate. Why is that so hard to do? <laughs> Good question. So. Thank you so much, Jenny. And thank you, everybody, for joining us. Great conversation, great chat going on there. Really do appreciate you, you making the time. We will be, be blah, blah, blah. We will be back. <laughs> we will. What you get for standing on your tiptoes and trying to close out the show. <laughs> uh, we will be back in two weeks. And we're going to leave you with some thoughts for the summer, some leadership thoughts for summer, uh, just because we probably won't be back again until early September, just with the way vacation schedules and such are lining up this summer as we take care of our own well-being. So uh, thank you all for joining us. Jenny, as always, thank you. I appreciate you. Uh, have a great Friday and a great weekend, everybody. <laughs>